Um, so uh, we're delighted to have uh, Ingrid Bilbashis to, to give our uh, third plenary talk of the week. Um, uh, Ingrid Dobashis is a professor at Duke University. Um, she has three titles within Duke University. She is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Electrical and Computer Engineering. She's a professor in the Department of Mathematics, and she's a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, she is uh, perhaps best, best known for her work on wavelets and has done work in image compression, digital art restoration, and biological morphology. Give some sense of the breadth of of, uh, of Ingrid's work. Um, her list of accolades is far too long to list, so I'll just mention uh, that she is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and it was also a MacArthur Fellow. Um, so um, I'll, uh, that's, that's enough about how amazing uh, Professor Debashis is. Um, so I'll just hand it over to her. The title of Ingrid's talk is Visualization for Research and Exposition. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Henry for this introduction. I also enjoy so much being uh, part of PCMI now in a different mode than I usually have been. I've been there as a lecturer, as a participant, as, as somebody talking to the teachers, and I've enjoyed it all. So uh, second, I would like to beg your forgiveness for uh, the talk, which will be a little bit more cobbled together than uh, my talks often are, although they always have some cobbled together for, uh, aspect to it. But uh, still, this one will be more so, because until two days ago, we were working very hard, uh, uh, I as well as, as Henry uh, Segerman and Sabeta Matsumoto and Edmund Harris, all of whom are part of, of, of PCMI, on working on a, a very special uh, presentation that does visualization of math and about which we will, uh, I will uh, talk at the very end of this presentation. So I promised to talk about uh, the role visualization has played in my research, my teaching, exposition and outreach. And although I had uh, planned to really talk about each of these separately, uh, it is, and start with research, I realize they're all interwoven somehow. So um, let me just give you an excerpt of uh, uh, the talk, the, the introduction talk I usually give on wavelets, which has a lot of visualization in it and which in which I can also help you. I mean, it will show you exposition at the same time as research. So, so that's a talk on wavelets. So uh, wavelets, illustrated via uh, image analysis. So, um, well, digital image consists of pixels. So I'll do it here with black and, and, and white grayscale images uh, because uh, that explains the mathematics I want to visualize. But of course, you do it in, 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 in color. I mean, images have red, green, and blue pixels and mixtures of them make the different colors that we see them because of the peculiarities of our eyes. Uh, you don't actually do when you do mathematical image, uh, uh, when you do image processing, you don't do the same in each of these colors that I'm going to describe. It turns out that our sensitivity for uh, uh, luminescence or for whether it's dark or light in an image is much higher than for exact tones of color. And so we are much more, well, most of us mortals are much more uh, uh, um, tolerant for slightly change, slight changes in scale. Although I have worked with artists who are, who have an acuity of vision that I find astounding. But, uh, okay, small scales, squares, uh, each one of them is really one level of gray. And we have a great many of them, those are the pixels. Uh, the gray levels in typical 8-bit images are, uh, we have 256 num uh, of them, so they're numbered from 0 to 255, from pure black, typically 0 to 255, pure white. Okay, so here's an example of a row of self-portrait by Van Gogh. If I have time, I'll talk a little bit about work I've done on, on images of, of paintings. But uh, And so if you blow that up and blow that up further and further, you see all these pixels. Um, I've taken a little portion of it here. And to remind myself that the dark numbers are 
uh, the, the lower numbers are darker colors. I have put those under 100 in bold. And we'll just take a very few of those to show the transformation that corresponds to a wavelet transform. So I, I hope you're seeing here that although I'm trying to, to bring this concept, I make it very visual. I think of this in very visual terms always. Okay, so we are, uh, one thing that images have in common, all natural images, not just photographs of paintings, is that an overwhelming number of pixels are very similar to the pixel right next to them. Of course, many pixels are very different from their neighbors, but in any image, the ones that are very different from their neighbors are a minority. They are the most important ones in that image because they give us the content of where different objects are and how they behave and so on. But, and which, at which locations those pixels that have this content uh, are, are, are situated differs from one image to the next. So any pixel in the image can play that role, but only a minority play that role in any given image. And so you, that's what you exploit when you do image processing with, with uh, wavelets. Here, we are exploiting it very simply by saying, look, if I take things in pairs, then I can compute just the average number and that will be typically close to each of the two of which it was an average. And even when I've done that once, I can do it again. And still, most of those averages will be close to the four grandparents it came from. Of course, there are places where they're not the same. And that is expressed very well by the differences. And so for each of the pairs in this first generation, I also compute the difference. And I do that again the second time. And what is now striking is that in most places, those differences are tiny. And where they're not, it really indicates that something was happening in the image. And so what is going on here is something uh, interesting. We have teased out from, by very simple mathematical transformation, where the location was where something was happening in the image. And we can then, with just those green circle numbers and a few averages, reconstruct back something that's very close to the original. And that's really all that's happening in, in, in image compression. There's a very nice, uh, mathematically, what we have done corresponds to the following. You can imagine if you just take one line of an image, a reasonable model for that is something that has continuous variation. Just to imagine taking a snapshot of, 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 I mean, where you, I'm sitting inside a room, you probably are too, since you're zooming. Uh, uh, I, I see the ceiling of, of my kitchen here. Uh, it's slowly varying and you see the ball behind me. It's slowly varying in intensity. And so that is a kind of smooth function. But you have abrupt transition where you go from the wall to the, the, uh, the, the window there. And so you can have sudden discontinuities and then again slow. Now, the, the landscape behind has texture and that's more complicated that doesn't correspond to this model. But so if you have something like that, the first thing we did is make a piecewise constant approximation. That was the pixelization. So we, we go from what in fact was already a model. It's not reality. I mean, because we always, make things a little bit more ideal in order to, 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 uh, to modelize it. We go to the pixelized version, which is a fine scale approximation. And then what we did to that is uh, uh, go to a coarser scale by taking the average of each pair, which is in this lighter blue. And that coarser approximation, I will do the same thing to take its averages. And, and then its averages, and again, and again. Now, when we have done that, when I went from, from this very fine approximation to a slightly less fine approximation, I made a mistake. And that mistake I've indicated here in red. The, for each pair, since I had two levels and I replace them by their average, I go as much up on one side as I go down on the other side. 
So if you just look at that difference function, it's an up south or a down up uh, oscillation. How much changes from, from space, from spot to spot. But uh, if you put them all together, all these differences, this is what you get. And at the next level, a similar thing happens and so on, and a similar thing. And so the differences I've put together are of this type. Um, and so each of these layers, the differences are just multiples of a basic building block put at the right amplitude in different places and do that at different scales. And so I have found that I decomposed my whole, uh, 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 my whole uh, uh, function, the different approximations indicated by uh, different indices, capital J, J minus one, J minus two, and so on, here are uh, given by uh, linear combinations of one building block scaled to the very narrow uh, width and moved around or wider and moved around or even wider and moved around. And the loss of detail is expressed in these, these wavelengths. And then, in fact, what happens is that you do uh, 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 a, much, uh, 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 a much more smarter averaging than the one I showed. Uh, which uses more coefficients and uh, uh, makes it possible to uh, have a better understanding of the detail. I mean, you see, if I, in what I was doing, I was doing a constant approximation. So that's fine if big blocks of your image are just going to have constant intensity. But if they vary slowly, then well, a piece as constant approximation is not going to do so well. It has very few degrees of freedom, but you don't capture them with a large scale constant approximation. You would capture them much better with something that has a slope. And so in order to capture that well, you have to go to slightly fancier wavelengths. But something else that, uh, um, and let me uh, uh, show that here on an interactive screen. Um, so I should share again, share here. OK. So um, something that was striking in what I did was that I was saying one of my building blocks. So I was going from piecewise constant levels, so a function that had this to something that was piecewise constant over larger stretches. So this kind of function, I can write as a combination of this uh, uh, top hat function in different locations. So, or if I don't want to write it, a n of hat x minus n, where h hat is where h is just this function, the function that's one between zero and one. Um, at the next level, the next lower level, I write it as a linear combination. So I go from here to there. And I write this as a linear combination of functions that are twice as wide. So that makes x over 2 minus m. I lose something in between. And that's where I introduced these oscillating functions, which enable you to, this is a function that if I made the same transition to it, would you give me just 0? It's something that lives only in one of the two representations and you don't see any more in the next, but it's exactly what you need to express the detail. Um, but some of what I had in the earlier one still is expressed in the last one. And that is because the function h, when I stretch it out by a factor two, so from zero to two, 
that's h x over two, can be expressed as the original function plus its translate by one. So the functions, the building blocks with which I make my approximation have this very special relationship that uh, they can be expressed. So another way of saying that is that h of t is h of 2t plus h of 2t minus 1. So more generally, if I don't want to do stupid little uh, averages, I will use uh, building blocks. I use these functions. These functions are called scaling functions and often denoted as phi of t. But they will have the property that they are linear combinations of the same function squished by a factor two and translated. And that has a very interesting uh, uh, consequence. And let me show that to you in, in, in an animation that I had made uh, some years ago. I am going to show you this equation. So I have a phi t is uh, hn phi t over n, and for reasons that are of, of convenience, uh, typically, let me see how in the animation I did it. Yes. So typically, one puts a square root 2 here, because that makes it possible. You see, this function here that I will have integral of its square equal to 1. And that makes this normalization reasonable, because if I take these functions and I take the integral of their squares, that will be one again. So h n are the coefficients that link these two. So the result of this equation is that you have a, a very beautiful link between uh, the functions. So then a very beautiful way of generating their graphs. Um, if you take, uh, sorry, if I take just a function that's one between zero and one and elsewhere it's zero. And I replace, I take for this function, this block function, I squish it by a factor two and I make copies of it with these different coefficients. So I write four blocks that have heights given by the HNs. Then each of those blocks, I will do the same thing to. So at the first block, the second block, the third block, the fourth block. And so if I add them all, so I add this to the first division, that gives me this. Then I add the third block to that division, it gives me this. And then I add the fourth to that division gives me this, and I get this profile. And I can do that again for each of these blocks. And adding them all up gives me this profile. And the interesting thing is that I'm combining here two different aspects. I mean, on the one hand, it's clear. I mean, I start from a building block and I do a certain transformation to it. I do this transformation with blocks that are half the width. I mean, each of these blocks is half the width of the original. Then by doing to each of these blocks the same thing again, it's clear that if I have a limit of the whole thing, so if this reaches a limit f, each of these blocks here will reach a limit that is a copy of the original f, but just squished and with the right amplitude. So I get that the limit function f will be automatically a linear combination of that function squished and translated 
and with a different aptitude. But the algorithm by which I create it is not, you see, if you look at this equation, it's an equation in which I relate f with f of 2x and f of 2x minus 1 and f of 2x minus 2. And in this case, I even go up to f of 2x minus 3. So with things that are located at uh, 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 arguments that are a whole integer apart, f of 2x, 2x minus 1, and so on. But the algorithm by which I build it is very local. If I go back to my uh, animation, uh, so now that was not the one I wanted, sorry. Um, here. What I was doing here was very local. Uh, sorry, was very local. I don't go full unit away. Here I'm actually only a, a, a quarter away. And as I go further, I will be even less away here. Every time I become more and more local in my algorithm. So my equation follows from the way the algorithm is built, but the algorithm to generate these graphs is more and more narrow and uh, it cascades down very quickly. It has exponential convergence to the graph of the, of the limit function, which has these kind of fractal properties. So when I was, first conceiving of these functions, uh, uh, oh my God, a long time ago, uh, something like 30 years ago, uh, I, I um, more than that, uh, it was an, an essential point for me that this visualization, on the one hand, the local algorithm, which uh, was an algorithm that was used in computer vision, and on the other hand, the fact that things were uh, identical and therefore you had this two-scale equation, it was a, a, a key element in, 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 in building these, these, these bases, which then turned out to be very useful for image compression. So um, I wanted to, to give you this, this very old example to, to show how that visualization was important for me in actually doing this, this, this research. Um, okay, so that has told you something about research and also already something about uh, 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 teaching, about the exposition. Um, in teaching, and I now just realized that I forgot to uh, uh, prepare to set up that screen for you, so let me do that quickly while I talk about it. Um, so I, I, at Duke, I teach, uh, I, I teach courses at many different levels, but I actually uh, regular, on a regular basis uh, teach multivariable calculus to engineers. I really like teaching that course, which most of my colleagues do not like to teach um, because it, it, it really helps me. Uh, uh, it, it, I find it a challenge to, uh, 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 to uh, explain to them uh, exactly why things work, uh, even though I will not give very rigorous epsilon delta proofs. So in uh, all the students who take that class, I typically teach in the fall and then I have lots of freshmen and they have placed out of one variable calculus. They are good in, in, in math, but they have by and large had the habit of uh, just learning all these formulas in blue boxes in their book by heart, and then just finding when they got a problem, which of the blue formulas uh, had to be applied. And I want to wean them from this habit because it's a bad habit in, 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 in doing mathematics. And I uh, uh, also want them to make, to really understand what is going on. And uh, for this reason, I had ages ago, uh, developed a, uh, a, a way of, of flipping the glass. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I had made uh, little videos in which I explained uh, the material and 
I and I, I uh, in 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 these videos which I made the students watch ahead of time, I explained a little bit and I showed that they had two visualizations. I made MATLAB visualizations. Those uh, they. I, I told them, I gave them a little tutorial about how to use MATLAB and they were engineering students, so they had a MATLAB license and they could then manipulate the little model. And the students really, really liked it. They liked the flipped nature. They liked the fact that they could view the videos many times and they liked that they could manipulate these models. And so I had then told my colleagues about them and by and large, most of my colleagues teaching these classes were uh, pure mathematicians. They had not used MATLAB. They were not going to use MATLAB and so it, it wasn't successful. Um, and I understand. I mean, why would they? I, I don't use uh, the software Sage that, that, that uh, some of them use and so on. So, uh, but when, when the pandemic came around and we had to teach this class online, uh, I, the, 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 the Duke asked for ideas of, of making things. I said, you know, if somebody could take these visualizations I made and made them something that you didn't have to have MATLAB for, something that was just online and people could play with, and that was tailored exactly to what we want to teach, then maybe it would be more useful. And we did that. And uh, so here, uh, let me start sharing again. I'm going to share a few of those with you. So we, uh, uh, this is part of the Sakai site for the course. So, uh, and, and uh, as the, the student, as part of Sakai, they had all these visualizations. This is just to explain a surface plot. I mean, uh, of, of how do you get a surface from a formula and they could look at points on the surface and what the X, Y, Z components were and so on. We, uh, what did I, what else did I, I uh, did we make? Um, okay, partial derivatives and the tangent plane. So all these things that I had designed before uh, we made little visualizations, so they got a surface, and we can look at a, where we have a particular x plane, a y plane. In each of these planes, you can write a tangent line, and that's something they're familiar with because they remember that from one one variable calculus. And then two, these two planes, which intersect in that one point, determine. Uh, these two lines are determine a plane, so that's the tangent plane, and you can then just look at that tangent plane. And the whole thing, let's, I mean, the whole thing is something where you can play with the figure, look at it from different sides. And, and I would have loved something that was more interactive where they could have chosen. And I know there exists software online to do that, but it was important in order to make these visualizations portable to all my colleagues, that it was something for which they would not have to do a lot of legwork all over the place. They were, I mean, uh, I, I know everybody in, in, in this PCMI course is completely used and familiar and happy with doing visualizations. So, uh, but if you interact with, with, with colleagues who are not so prone to do that, and I'm afraid that it's probably going to take another generation before everybody really, really likes this, uh, it is good to, to have models like this to, 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 to show and, and to, to play with. Okay, what else did we have? Well, some, some, sometimes it was some problems had difficult things to set up. So here they, uh, as part of, of trying to, to think of what is it that you define as something bounded by two surfaces, we gave them two paraboloids and again, they could play with it. And, uh, and then you could just look at the 3D region between them and they could see that it was this, this, this weird thing, but that when you looked at it from above it was bounded by a circle. I mean, well, standard things of multivariable calculus, but just the fact that they could grab hold of the object on the screen um, made it uh, then uh, optimization under constraint. I forget what that one is. Um, okay. So this one seems to have broken since the last time I looked at it. I'm sorry about that. Um, next, maybe. No. Okay, so um, usually when I teach multivariable uh, uh, calculus, 
uh, I do a, a lot of, of gesturing in front of, of, of the class. I mean, I, I show that the saddle when a saddle surface is something that you can put as a saddle on somebody, but you see on Zoom that doesn't come over. In front of the classroom, it comes a little bit better. But so uh, then path integrals. So you have a curve on the plane here, then you have a surface above it, and then you have that curve on the surface here. And we, there's more to this than this visualization, but I can't believe that this is already broken. So maybe it's because my screen is too small, too big, no. Okay, what happens then is that there's a further visualization in which you actually uh, build up the integral uh, uh, of to find the length of the curve or to find the function value on the curve and so on. That's one sad thing uh, with visualizations is that they break so quickly. I mean, I wish that weren't the case. Uh, maybe that will change, but uh, okay. So then next outreach. So there are uh, uh, a number of, of, of uh, different things, I, two different things I want to tell you about this here at, at this stage of, 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 of this presentation. One is a, a, a project in which, which had a tremendous impact, much more than I expected. Uh, 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 and and uh, in which we worked together with the North Carolina Museum of Art uh, uh, on, on a uh, rejuvenation of a, uh, of a painting. So let me quickly tell you about that and then tell you how visualization became important, although the whole thing was visualization, really. So you can find out more about this in uh, uh, Duke IPA. So ipai.org, I'm writing, typing that in the chat right now. So it's Duke Image Processing for Art Investigation. It was our own joke of, of how close, this was the closest we were ever, ever going to get to CSI. And uh, so let me share, let me not forget to share. So, uh, okay. Well, you probably all are on the screen already, but if, since you're visual people, the way I know you. Um, so um, we did a project with the, with the North Carolina Museum of Art, which among its collections has uh, uh, several panels from Altor piece that I'm showing you now. What I'm showing you now is a, uh, a mock-up. It's actually not a mock-up, it's a photograph of a, the, the, the altarpieces, it was reunited for just six months. So what happened is that the uh, uh, North Carolina Museum of, of, of Art had uh, of the panels that you see here, it has in its collection three panels, the bottom left, the second from left in top row, and then the uh, uh, the mid the, the the second from right in the bottom row. These three are in its collection. The curator of Italian art, uh, who retired a, a year ago, uh, had discovered that panels from this same other piece were in other collections in the U.S. Uh, and in fact, they probably were acquired around the same time when the whole altarpiece was broken up. Uh, it was broken up when church was decommissioned and uh, art dealers in, in Europe uh, found that yes, they could make more money from a whole altarpiece, but they could make even more than from a single panel, but they could make more money from nine panels than from one altarpiece. So they typically would divide these things up and that's why altarpieces are often divided now among different museums. So the top left was in Portland. The three here, the, the, the second from left on, on, on the bottom and the two at the top right uh, here were in the uh, collection of the Metropolitan Museum, are in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And the central one is in uh, the, the, the Art Institute in uh, Chicago. 
So when he realized, and he could see that from details, that they belonged to the same altar panel, uh, altarpiece, he wanted to bring them together. And uh, other museums were not so interested because there's one of them that's missing. This one, the bottom right here, at the uh, reunion was actually not a painting painted on, on, on panel. It was, a, it was a printout. A printout of what? Well, it turns out that, so this piece has been missing since the altar piece was divided. There's no trace of it anywhere in the literature. It may have gone destroyed. We don't know. Um, these, this altarpiece, this uh, 14th century altarpiece, shows, in fact, the life of John the Evangelist in order. It's like a little cartoon book uh, uh, or a, a graphical novel, as, 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 as they're now called also, of the life of John the Evangelist according to a medieval bestseller, which was called The Golden Legend, which had a lot of lives of saints. And it followed it exactly. So they, they knew what scene was missing. And together uh, uh, with uh, the art curator, a reconstruction of this panel was made using elements of the other panel. So surely, if it ever gets found, it's not going to look like this, because this was just a guess. But it would have, if this were had been put instead of the right panel in the 14th century, it would not have been shocked anybody, because it was the right scene with the right kind of composition. And you can on this website find a beautiful uh, 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 little video of how Charlotte Caspers, the artist who is an expert on reconstructing. So not just copying, but copying in the way things would have been painted by the original artist with the original pigments, original techniques and so on, made this new panel. And she made this beautiful, wonderful little uh, 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 panel uh, that looks like it would have looked new because, well, it was new. And it's only when she had done this that they realized they couldn't put it next to the other ones because it would have detracted from these old ones that are faded, where the gold is no longer gleaming and polished and burnished. And it would have been the only one that was not authentic. So they just couldn't do that. They couldn't age it virtually, uh, physically either because that would have defeated the purpose of showing what this thing would have looked like new. Plus, I mean, curators all over would have been so upset at a museum creating something that could be considered a fake, even though they didn't produce it as a fake. It would have easily, if it were ever stolen, it would. Uh... So what we did is we aged it virtually. And that was uh, uh, an interesting, uh, uh, and I, I didn't find the right figure to show you, but I, I'll, I'll do it with my hands in the air on Zoom. So the way people painted in that time. So we saw this, uh, these, these, these uh, mantles. So you see here uh, on, on, the, on the right, you see the new panel. And you see how it borrowed composition elements from the left. On the left, you see the, the panel that is in the collection of the Museum of Art in North Carolina. And you see how the colors have shifted. Now, in that uh, time in Italian uh, late medieval, early Renaissance painting, what they did is they would mix the basic color, for instance, of the mantle. And then they would prepare something with a little bit more light color in and something with a little bit more dark color in. So what that means in RGB space is that you have the color. And if you have a little bit more light, that means that in RGB space, you move along a certain line of this lighter color. And the dark, you move in a different line. So in fact, what happens is that you're describing in RGB space a plane. And when you look at all the pixels, and I'm so sorry, I didn't find that uh, picture again, but when you look at all the pixels, I mean, we have uh, hundreds of pixels because we had very high resolution pictures of this in, 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 in RGB space, they do form a very, very flat uh, 
pancake-like cloud in RGB space. And we did the same for the reconstructed one, and they follow a simple, a similar pancake. And I thought, oh, well, that's easy. We can do an automatic recoloring by just taking the old pixels and moving and then maybe rotating them in the right place. And it turned out to our great surprise that the rotation was virtually non-existent. So now we actually have a whole project where we recolor other paintings. We first segment them. Then we, with curators, talk about what should the average color be. And they have a GUI on which they can uh, choose that. And then we recolor them virtually. And so I have a team of undergraduates who, are, who have recolored other paintings of this type. They, I mean, they actually, they were students from the multivariable class because there was social distancing. They had no social life. And so they had time on their hands in the fall. I said, could we do a project? And I said, well, it's more a linear algebra project than, than multivariable, but they were game. And so they have for the museum recolored a number of paintings this way. So again, visualization played a role because when I could show them that plane and how it moved, it made linear algebra really come alive in a completely different uh, setting than the traditional mechanical uh, uh, throwing a tennis ball in the air and making a parabola and so on uh, uh, visualization. So that was that. And then for the final few minutes before we go to Q&A, um, again, I want to talk about visualization of mathematics in a completely different setting. So for the last two years, uh, a team of uh, uh, 24 mathematicians and artists have worked together, first with a lot of discussion and when conceiving and fabricating, all in our own little, little cocoons at home and, 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 and uh, different objects in order to build together a big installation that we call Mathemalchemy, the alchemy of mathematics. I mean, how in mathematics ideas come up in one context and come again in a different context and, 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 and how it's all beautiful and fun. And so uh, let me show here to uh, the, uh, uh, so you can find the mathemalchemy.org site. So I think I'm not sharing yet. So let me first in the chat give you uh, that link, mathemalchemy.org. Okay. And on that website, so now I'm going to share. Yes. You can find uh, a 3D view of what is really a tabletop maquette. So this was a tool that was built uh, uh, last year by a, uh, uh, the artistic director, Dominique Herman, of this project, of this big installation, which in the last few weeks we have been building in full reality in, uh, at, at Duke, and it will stand there for those who are in the neighborhood in the next few months until November, after which it will be packed up and traveled to Washington DC where it will have its first official exhibit. And we visualize mathematics in so many different ways. For instance, you have here these, these ball arches. So in one of them, the diameters decrease geometrically. And so the total length of the arch is finite, of course, because that's a converging series. In the other one, they decay like a power that's less than one. So I think it's like n to the minus a quarter. But so the result is that the diameters are smaller and smaller and smaller. But because the sum of these is divergent, this arch in principle will go on forever. I mean. It, in our installation, it delves into the ocean after which you can't see it anymore, but in, in our imagination, it goes on past, it crosses the earth uh, on the other side, it goes past Arcturus, it leaves the galaxy and so on. And we'll describe it that way, of course. But uh, they have these beautiful colors, but some, some of us extra decoration. And if you look at which ones, it's the third and the fifth and the seventh. 
and then not it's not the odd numbers because nine has nothing but 11 and 13 are decorated again we say oh 15 not yeah that fits 17 and 19 again not 21 23 turns out to be unadorned as well so it's not the primes so something else is going on it turned 27 is not of course but 29 and 31 are and so we let people discover which one. So every single component in the whole thing has, we discussed it a lot, we, that's one. It visualizes so much mathematics in this one installation. And I actually have just yesterday, because we just finished the whole thing on Tuesday, I mean, two days ago. And just yesterday, uh, I walked around and uh, uh, made some movies of, of uh, of, of the finished installation. And uh, I'm actually, I, I just, I haven't even watched them myself. This is the first time I watched them. These are made with my phone. And so you see these adorned balls, the balls themselves, everything is also exquisitely crafted, are made in a, 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 a Japanese embroidery uh, a system that's called Temari. You have lots of mathematical ideas swirling around. So that was the end of that short movie, another one because I was changing points of view all the time. And uh, here you have little squirrels actually trying out the civil Aristoteles and bringing different screens to screen out for multiples of seven and multiples of 11 and so on. Uh, uh, on the other, other tiles on the floor actually illustrate uh, primes in a different number field. Here you have a whole pile of books on which a little girl who's discovering mathematics uh, uh, is sitting. And it has the elements of Euclid, but it also has uh, books in, in, in Arabic and Sanskrit and Chinese. And, and then it has books which are on weaving. I mean, weaving has a lot of math in it, uh, uh, but this book was not written by a mathematician. Uh, um, this is another one. Have we seen this one yet? Oh, this one. Yes, here from the books we go on. Here's the mountain. And the, you have a vortex sheet that comes out of the trumpet. Um, you have, these are the balls, the balls and the embroidery. So they're wrapped in yarn and then uh, embroidered uh, with, the, as I said, the Tamari technique. And here you see, I think 17 and 19. No, that was already. And 2931. And uh, and you see the balls going down in the ocean. And um, this is exquisite. This is the quilt. It it illustrates many, many different things of cryptography. I mean, and there's some hidden messages in there. And uh, it alludes to the, the, the whole relation itself and it alludes to many other things. Uh, it's a beautifully made quilt. Uh, Dominique Ehrman is really a, a, a quilter and it's, it, her technique is just impeccable and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and then here I think is the last of the little movies I made. Ah, this is the bakery close to my heart because I helped design it. Uh, so this is the display. Oh, look on that the wheel here. The wheel of the of the display cart has uh, a superposition of a uh, a gasket. And okay, so that's I think the end of the movies. I had some more, but I haven't transferred them to my computer yet. And I should leave you some time for Q and A. Actually, Henry Sigerman has a beautiful uh, little video that he made of, uh, the, of, of, of the maquette and, and, and the whole intent of Mathematalchemy. And he's making a much more uh, beautiful video, which isn't ready yet about Mathematalchemy. Okay, Q&A. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for a beautiful talk. I just posted in the chat um, uh, the, this, the uh, a video that I made about um, the project as it existed before we came together at Duke University a few weeks ago. And I have lots of footage which I have yet to find the time to put together of, of what was happening, well, about a week ago. Um, um, but yes, um, uh, let's open the floor to questions. You can either 
type in the chat and I'll I'll uh, I'll um I'll say it or, or just just turn on your mic. So. If I can hear somebody typing, or if that's just uh, that's Indra, is there a question for Indra? Ah, uh, and I see in the chat that people found that there was a print primes. Yes. Oh well, that was me. If somebody mm -hmm. guessed it. Someone guessed it. Yeah, somebody guessed it. That's why I said somebody guessed it, and then you confirmed. So somebody did guess. Good. And some knitting, yes, of course. Actually, the knits have a message in them. Uh, knits was in there in cryptography because knits were used in the Second World War to transmit messages. Uh, people would send knits to to uh, from from uh, to to to, to uh, front lines and so on, or in packages disguised as things that were for soldiers, but they really had messages in them. And so, so these knits do have messages. We researched all that and. and uh, Question in the chat. I'll, I'll just read out the question so that they go on the recording. Can you elaborate more on how you went from visualizing the averages to constructing the special wavelets? Okay, so um, the the visualization played not so much a role in constructing the special wavelet as in in understanding. And in fact, I I have in that cascade wavelet uh, that cascade animation a little bit more actually. Uh, in the animation, I uh, show how we did that uh, with with uh, sorry with uh, the uh, this is a scaling function for the four tap wavelet. That was if you had good choices for the coefficients. But suppose you change the choices slightly. And you repeat the construction. In the beginning, it doesn't look so different. But as you iterate, you actually get a very, very different and much less smooth looking object. And that's because it turns out that you don't, the visualization illustrates it, but uh, you uh, mathematically you analyze by looking at the limiting process and proving things about it that you need the coefficients to satisfy certain conditions. So in order to get orthonormal basis, the sum of the squares of all these coefficients have to have a certain uh, property. They have to, to add up to one or a half, I forget, in this normalization. But uh, you also want the sum of the even coefficients to be equal to uh, the sum of the odd coefficients. And I don't actually remember whether that's the case in the example I give here. Uh, it isn't so, uh, and then you want the uh, you want a further property. And if these are not satisfied, the visualization immediately tells you that things are off. So, uh, uh, so in that sense, the visualization helped illustrate that. But to me, the visualization in the conception was important in realizing that I was basically building the same thing in combinations. I. I when I saw these blocks and each of these blocks raining down and them combining to give and so on, that the link between the equation, which was non-local, and the local algorithm was something that, that I got from that visualization, that imaginary visualization in my head. And that's why I like showing it when I give a talk about it. It's another question here in the chat. Uh, in putting together math alchemy, did you find it easier or harder to represent certain areas or aspects of math than you did others? Well, uh, we, we didn't want to represent all of math. And in fact, we could uh, fill many, many more projects with math that we completely omitted. Uh, the way we, we wanted it to be playful and beautiful and fun and to integrate with many different interwoven stories and that would come up and emerge in different places. And uh, we... Uh, we were, I mean, many of us, uh, not, not me because I'm an amateur in these, but many of us are, are, were superb artists and craftspeople who had experience in conveying mathematics through their art and, and craft. But typically they would take one concept or and make a beautiful object 
or and now we were thinking of a whole illust- uh, a whole world i mean a wonderland and uh all these different techniques also so it was very important to to dominic and me who proposed the project that everybody would feel that their way of looking at it was represented fully or as fully as possible in a communal work. But, and so we had many, many, many discussions of what to put in and how to put it in and so on. And those discussions really determined. I mean, and in, in the little video that Henry posted, uh, he said, whatever concept we could think of and that we could squeeze in, in it went. I mean, he didn't say it maybe in those words, but that was generally the spirit. I mean, and, uh, uh, but of course, it was a finite object, a finite installation. And more of us were uh, algebraists or topologists than analysts. And so there's quite a bit more uh, uh, discrete mathematics and algebra and topology than there is uh, analysis, for instance. Uh, but, but that's just the way of, I mean, everything is delightful. And I don't think there's a single person among us who knew everything that is represented. We were all explaining things to each other. Just, I think actually, just in general, analysis seems to be, to me, to be harder to illustrate than algebraic or topological. Things. Oh, and I don't them. think so at all. I mean, I, I yeah. well, analysis is well. I'm an analyst, so I mean, analysis. The difference between analysis and algebra, for my again, I have a, a visual metaphor for this, which, which, uh, I mean, uh, analysis is the mathematics of the overstuffed sock. I mean, what if I stuff a bit more in here? At what point will it start bulging and how much? Well, algebra is, is the, the mathematics of, the, of the, 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 the tinker toys. I mean, you build beautiful things. And if you don't tap it with a hammer, if you're lucky, nothing happens. But if you're not lucky, it just is gone. The whole structure is gone. And uh, that's to me the difference. And uh, both of me, I think, can be very, maybe very visual. But, uh... Maybe one last question. Uh, oh, we've got a bunch more questions. Okay, maybe a couple more. So, so uh, uh, were Tenniel's illustrations of Alice in Wonderland an explicit inspiration? Well, we very quickly saw that we were creating a Wonderland. And some of us uh, resisted that a bit, and others thought it was wonderful. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, so we also haven't really named the whole construction yet. I mean, I had come up with this idea of mathematical alchemy as a, an alchemy of different mathematics and so on. But it's the project, the mathematical alchemy project, the installation itself. Still, we'll, we'll name it. May end up with that name or not? Uh, it's something we still have to discuss in our next group meeting. But. Uh, uh, some of the names were come play with us in our wonderland or things like that, but that was a bit long. But uh, yes, the wonderland idea occurred to us too. Another question? I am, I don't have a chat in front of me. I, so. I'll, I'll just, maybe we've got time for maybe one more. Uh, you mentioned that there were these planes in RGB space. I yes. was wondering what a curved subspace would correspond to. Well, uh, I, I, well, what that would uh, correspond to is mixtures of colors that you don't achieve by simply taking one and, and mixing others. Or you could have something in which pigments interact and start uh, chemically and start doing something else than mixing. I, mean, I don't know whether painters would like that. Maybe Sabetta can answer there. <laughs> I don't think that, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's a lot of fun things with sort of optics now where you have like uh, like like dichroic things where the um, gradient of the surface gives you different yeah. colors. So that's a, another thing that. Um, well, and dichroic things we wouldn't be able to capture with RGB. Actually, that's an, an interesting point for these these uh, these these uh, late medieval things, because a burnished. Uh, gold background which was then marked with punches which would reflect uh, the light very differently were important that is something we could not model just with flat pictures so the final modeling was to take the flat picture and put it on a 3d object where you had uh, uh, we modeled the reflection uh, with, with rendering 
and uh, and if you if you look at the videos at the the the, the Gissi project, then uh, you will see actually in the ex in the exhibit. Oh, I didn't say that. But what happened in the exhibit was that they put all the panels together with a high resolution printout of our virtually aged panel which was good enough that you had to look closely to see that it was printed paper. Then they had a new panel on one wall together with an explanation of all the pigments and techniques. Then you had a third wall with a video of uh, Charlotte Caspers, the artist who made them making uh, uh, this, and which was very interesting. And then on the fourth wall, you had a huge panel on which you saw the, because once you can age it, you can rejuvenate. And so we rejuvenated all the panels and we showed that in 3D and we had little iPads with interviews of the undergrads. It was all done with undergrads because most of the techniques we used were not research techniques, but were things that you had to work out a lot in order to make it work for this application. Uh, explained about how they had done things and how they had experienced it. And, 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 and the exhibit from being something that they expected would only get a few experts uh, and so on became something hugely popular. The sons loved it. They all incorporated it in the tours if they were given the choice of what to show. And it had a tremendous uh, public. So that was a wonderful thing. Well, it's, uh, it's past uh, 2 p.m. Mountain time now. So we should, we should thank uh, uh, Ingrid once again for a beautiful talk. Thank you.